You're listening to The Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. The 16th century saw the rise of a very powerful society based upon a secret cult in the mountains of Afghanistan. The Roshaniya are the illuminated ones. References to the existence of this mystical fraternity exist from the time of the House of Wisdom at Cairo several hundred years before. In fact, the Roshaniya are just a later emergence of the old cult of the assassins. It seems likely that small branches were founded in various parts of the Near and Middle East, which would account for the special usage of the names of the eight degrees of initiation among them. The earliest figure named in the history of the cult is one Bayezid Ansari of Afghanistan, whose family claimed descent from the Ansar, the helpers who assisted Muhammad after his flight from Mecca nearly 1,400 years ago. As a reward for this service, he stated his ancestors had been granted initiation into the mysteries of the Ishmaelite religion. The secret inner training which dated from Abraham's rebuilding of the temple at Mecca, the mystical Haram, to the assassins, through the Roshania, and into Europe via the Knights Templar. Bayezid's own father, however, was known to be as narrowly conventional as anyone in the country, and one account of the rapid rise of the sect has it that Bayezid, after a period of preparation for the normal priesthood, was converted to his strange doctrine by a missionary from the Ismailis, the sectarians holding a secret doctrine supposedly handed down in the family of the prophet who maintained hidden lodges throughout the world of Islam and also claimed, after the Crusades, to have penetrated with their ideas even Spain, Germany, France, and parts of Britain. However this may be, the Illuminated Ones soon became more than a headache for the governors of Afghanistan, the Mughal rulers of India, and their Persian neighbors. Not far from Peshawar, which is now in the northwest of Pakistan, Bayezid set up a small school where he carefully coached those who had been initiated by him in the knowledge of the supernatural that he claimed. A period of probation was expected from each candidate, during which he would go into periods of concealment or meditation, known as kilwat, or silence. During this time, he was to receive the illumination, which was emanated from the Supreme Being, who desired a class of perfect men and women to carry out the organization and direction of the world. Bayezid collected in this way, over a period of three years, about fifty staunch disciples, whom he had trained in obedience, and to whom, so we are told, he had shown a way whereby they could liberate their inner powers. Well, this meant that they were ready to follow his further instructions. These orders, according to what his opponents say, were that the whole sect would now become bandits to prey upon the rest of the world, and all those who could not identify themselves by their secret sign were their legal and lawful prey. Little information is available from the other side, but three letters said to have been written from one branch to another contain an outline, a plan to reshape the entire social system of the world, first taking control of individual countries one by one. And where 
Have we heard that before? We've heard it from every one of the histories of all of these different sects of Mystery Babylon, which on the outward appearance seem to be different from each other. On the esoteric level, are one and the same religion, with one and the same plan, with one and the same goal, all working toward that end. And the end always, always justifies the means. Now, something does survive of the degrees of initiation. The first was Salik, or seeker, followed by Murid, disciple. Fakir, humble devotee. Arif, enlightened one. Khwaja, master. Emir, commander. Imam, priest. And Malik, chief or king. This succession does not follow the usual pattern of promotion in the Muslim mystical secret societies, the Tariqas, and seems to have been specially devised for this one. In the first three degrees, the candidate perfected himself by repetitions of certain phrases which were believed to carry power. Examples are these, Rabba, Afrina'a, Heya, Hafida, Kwawaya. Of these words, all Arabic are Persian. The first stands for the concept of lordship, the second for creation, the third for life, the fourth for protection, and the last for absolute power. If they were repeated with deep meditation upon various forms of their manifestations in human life, it was believed the appropriate power would come in to the devotee. Now, no special deity was worshipped, but it was believed that there was a supreme overall power, which was known by the sum of its individual powers, lordship, protection, and so on, a type of pantheism which works its way into the modern mystical societies of today. And that when one had meditated upon them all, and they had become the property of the invocant, he would thenceforward be a man of complete power. Now, folks, this kind of idea underlies a good deal of religious and magical thinking in many faiths, though it is seldom put in as concise a manner. The enlightened one of the fourth degree was he who could attain, during the rituals, complete identification with this overall power and was guided by it in all that he did. It was said that he could communicate directly with the unknown or hidden supervisors. Now this meant that, apart from the guidance of the chief, he was free to suit his own pleasure in life. No theological or social bonds limited him. It is at this stage, said the Illuminated, that the Arif could perform acts of wonder and magic, influence the physical world, and know the secrets of others. He attained this degree through the acceptance of him by the Master to whom he had confided his dreams and mystical ecstasies. The master alone really knew whether these were true or false experiences and promoted him accordingly. Some people proceeded to the higher degrees without going through all the lower ones because they were helped by the spirits of former illuminates who had died. The master, emir, imam, and malik degrees were reserved for the very highest men and women initiates. After the fifth degree, the segregation of the sexes in rituals was no longer practiced. Anyone of the degree of imam and higher could start his own lodge and make his own disciples. Bayezid decided to move his headquarters into the most inaccessible mountains of Afghanistan, where he set up a large and luxurious castle and from which he directed his military and bandit operations designed to overcome the rest of the East. His missionaries were sent far and wide, but received little official support. The cult did, however, spread among merchants and soldiers who thought that this gateway to mystical experiences was something to enter. They contributed lavishly to the chief's upkeep and his most expensive military, political, and espionage system. The heady wine of this success seems to have affected the prudence of the head illuminate more strongly than it should, for his claims became more and more extreme in public, as most usually do. There was, he now preached, 
no afterlife of the kind currently believed in, no reward or punishment, only a spirit state which was completely different from earthly life. The spirits, if they belonged to the order, could continue to enjoy themselves and be earthly powers, acting through living members, but that was all. The preaching of this spiritual vampirism seemed to delight his followers as much as it infuriated his enemies, because Bayezid now gave out more and more of the new doctrine based upon his no-afterlife creed. Eat, drink, be merry, gain power, look after yourself. You have no allegiance except to the order, he told them and all humanity which cannot identify itself by our secret sign is our lawful prey. The secret signal was to pass a hand over the forehead, palm inwards, the countersign to hold the ear with the fingers and support the elbow in the cupped other hand. And you can see that sign be exchanged even today in the courts of law all over the United States of America between lawyers and judges, defendants and judges, prosecutors and judges, prosecutors and defending lawyers, etc., etc., etc. Bayezid took to himself the style of Pir Aroshan, or Sage of Illumination, and founded a city at Hashnagar, which was to be the center from which Illuminism was to spread all over the world. Now, each member of his following was given a new name upon entry. Does that sound familiar? And this name depended upon the guild to which he, in theory, belonged. According to Bayezid, all humanity was divided into professions. His were lamp makers. Some members were the makers, others sold lamps. Some were known as this kind of lamp, some another. Lamp of the Darkness was a typical example. Among the other guilds noted are those of the builders. Does that sound familiar? Soldiers, merchants of various kinds, and scribes. They can be found today in organizations such as the American Medical Association or the American Bar Association, etc., etc. Writing in the 19th century, an Afghan scholar who was by no means fond of the society of the Roshaniya claimed that they were, in fact, an organization devoted to fighting against the tyranny of the Mughals, and that the banditry and strange doctrines attributed to them were untrue, allegations by interested parties. He based this upon two manuscript copies of the objectives of the order, which seem to have stated that it was dedicated to influencing people of importance throughout the East and West towards greater justice and self-training into the immense capacities of the human mind, whereby wonders can be caused and through which the harmony of the world will be established. Now, these ideas are taken from those enshrined in our ancient literature and practices, as well as those of the Persians, many of whom followed the true illuminated path before the new message was revealed, they stated. In the end, the imperial mogul decided that something must be done about the widespread power of the militant mystics of the Hindu Kush mountains. The governor of Kabul arrested Bayezid, clapped him in irons, and paraded him through the streets to show that here was no supernatural being. To give further point to the proceedings, his hair and beard were half-shaved, but this governor, Moshin Khan, was under the ascendancy of his religious guide, one Sheikh Atari, who may even have been a secret adherent of the Illuminated One, for the cult was spreading with rapidity. In any case, he told the governor that Bayezid was undoubtedly a man of great and holy attainments, and that considerable suffering would inevitably attend anyone who treated this man harshly. Bayezid was allowed to escape. The indignities to which he had been subjected kindled his aluminism still higher. Calling his numerous companions, he retired to tribal Terra, where he set up a military and court atmosphere which is still remembered for its glamour, fervor, and mystery. India and Persia 
<clears throat> were to be overcome by force of arms, he announced. To that end, many more were to be enrolled into the ranks of the illuminated. Enthusiastic scenes throughout Afghanistan resulted from the proclamation which was carried far and wide to the accompaniment of kettle drums and wild sword dances. And when he was ready, Bayezid, attended by his halka, our circle of dervishes, led the campaign into the lush land of India, intercepted by the Moshin Khan, whom he had earlier escaped. He was wounded, put to flight, and he eventually died as a result of this encounter. His son, Omar Ansari, proclaimed himself leader, and immediately ordered an attack upon the Pathan tribe of the Yusufzai, who had allied themselves with the Mughal. He was killed by the hillman, and his own son, quote, the servant of the one, unquote, took over the leadership. And by the middle of the 17th century, this youth had been killed defending his castle against a Mughal expeditionary force. His infant son escaped with some of his followers into Afghanistan proper, where the cult was restarted. The descendants of this Abdul Kidar, servant of the powerful, continued to rule the fanatics and to send their teachers far and wide. The creed eventually split into two divisions, the military and the religious and nowadays it is only the followers of the latter who survive still a secret cult which might given the right conditions have touched off a movement as important as that of the assassins now forty years after the last religio military leader of the afghan illuminated ones died a society of the same name the illuminati came into being in germany formed it is said by adam weishaupt the young Jesuit priest, a professor of canon law at the Jesuit Ingolstadt University. Coincidences of date and beliefs connect these Bavarian Illuminati with the Afghan ones, and also with the other cults which called themselves Illuminated. In actual fact, they are all the same. The beginning of the 17th century saw the foundation of the Illuminated Ones of Spain, the Alumbrados, condemned in an edict of the Grand Inquisition in 1623, out of which the condemned Ignatius Loyola emerged as a man, as a man immune to prosecution, arrest, or accusation from any king, prince, or prelate as the head of one of the most powerful secret societies ever organized, the Society of Jesus, now known as the Jesuits. Ignatius Loyola had been the leader of the Alumbrados in Spain, and it was his sect, the Illuminated Ones, or the Alumbrados, which became the Society of Jesus. In 1654, the illuminated Guernets came into public notice in France. Now, documents still extant show several points of resemblance between the German and Central Asian illuminists, points which are hard to account for on the grounds of pure coincidence, and yet which still might, one supposes, be nothing more than that. The Prophet Muhammad, for example, is claimed as an initiate by the Western Illuminati. Their calendar is the very same which survived in current usage in the former Iranian territories among the Afghans of the time. New Year's Day with them was the same day as the Persian and Afghan Nevroz festival. Further, the degrees of initiation, although seemingly artificial ones coupled with some of the degrees of Freemasonry, were also eight and there are parallels in the naming of the individual degrees. Like the Roshaniya, the Illuminati stated that they had the objective of gaining important converts for the purpose of improving the state of the world. A comparison of the degrees shows the similarity. In the Roshaniya, the seeker, and in the Illuminati, the apprentice. In the Roshaniya, the disciple. In the Illuminati, the fellow craft. In the Roshaniya, the devotee, in the Illuminati, the Master. In the Roshaniya, the Enlightened One. In the Illuminati, the Illuminatus Major. In the Roshaniya, the Master. In the Illuminati, the Illuminatus Dirigens. In the Roshaniya, the Commander, or Emir. And in the Illuminati, Prince. In the Roshaniya, Priest. 
in the Illuminati, priest. And the Roshaniya, king or chief, in the Illuminati, king. Now the early stages of initiation were designed to admit people into the brotherhood to test them for reliability and possibly to train them for responsible tasks connected with the greater diffusion of knowledge. Even in higher degrees, it seems that tests are also applied. Those who were to become priests, for example, were taken to a secret place where a throne stood, with before it the choice of priestly or royal regalia. The aspirant had to make the choice. Those who opted for the symbols of worldly power were dismissed promptly, but candidates taking up the sacred vestments were saluted with the phrase, Hail, O Holy One. The members of this degree were considered teachers in whose hands was the training of disciples. Priests identified themselves with a secret sign. Both hands crossed were placed flat upon the head. In shaking hands, the priest extended his palm with the thumb held vertically upwards. The countersign was a fist with the thumb enclosed within it. Princes were those who could influence events at a very high level either in academic or political affairs. The room in which the initiation to this high and secret degree was celebrated was hung with red. The garments which the prince was to wear were red and white. Now these are, of course, the colors of the Ishmaelis as well. In the ritual, the candidate is presented as a slave and states that he wants to liberate society from tyranny. The sign of the degree was the extending of both arms. As the countersign, before taking the hand of another, the prince gripped both his elbows. In 1786, a raid upon the house of an influential lawyer, Zwack, revealed secret papers connected with the order. And it is through those that many of the inner workings of the organization became known. Men were to be influenced through their women folk and a large-scale plan for initiating women members was at an advanced stage of development. It has been widely claimed and touted that many of the charges which were made against the German Illuminati were false, and that the possession of instructions, for instance, on forging seals, was due to the fact that the lawyer Zwack had a collection devoted to that subject as a matter of legal interest to him. It is also said that the project of enrolling women and young girls had in actual fact been taken from the aims of a very different society, the Mopses. While this matter still remains open, however, one may as well examine some of the documents which are stated to have belonged to the society. Zwack had written in his own hand a document describing the manufacture of a strong box which would blow up if it were tampered with. He also had a collection of impressions of the seals of several hundred important persons and the already mentioned data on how to forge or substitute them. These, he stated in a letter of protest, were a part of the exhibits of his criminological collection. <laughs> the famous memorandum detailing the plan to win over women to the cause comes from papers seized at the home of Baron Bassus, one of the members. The document states that women are the best means of influencing men. They should be enrolled and into their minds put a hope that they might themselves in time be released from the tyranny of public opinion. Another letter asks how young women can be influenced since their mothers would not consent to their being placed under the Illuminati for instruction. Five women were suggested by one member as a start. They were four stepdaughters of one of the Illuminati who were to be placed in the care of the wife of yet another illuminated one. They, in their turn, would enlarge the society through their friends. It was further mentioned that women are not considered to be really suitable for such an undertaking, because they are, quote, fickle and impatient, unquote. But the order was most sorely hit by the fact that something quite discreditable to the character of the founder was discovered, and it was thought that he might be trying to use the organization for personal reasons. Now the establishment version goes something like this. Weishop, upon the suppression of the order, refused a pension which he was offered after he had been dismissed from his professorial chair. 
He attributed his downfall to the machinations of the Jesuits, whom he hated and who had opposed him, as he was not of their number, whereas they considered the university post which he held to be a long-standing prerogative of their own. And nothing could be farther from the truth. For Adam Weishaupt was himself a Jesuit priest, holding a professorial chair at a Jesuit university. Now he and Zwack were both banished, and little is heard of them thereafter, although there are rumors that they carried on the society, respectively, in saxe coburg in the Netherlands. Another incident that you will not hear in establishment accounts is the story of the messenger riding from one Bavarian Illuminati lodge to another, who was literally struck by lightning, divine intervention, if you will, struck dead from his horse in his pouch carrying the papers of a secret plan to take over individual nations and ultimately the world, were put into the hands of the Bavarian government. And many of the portions of these papers are almost word for word what later became known as the protocols of the wise men. Illuminism had spread to France. However, some years before its suppression in Germany, influential personages were members, many drawn from the ranks of the important Free Masons of Paris. As in the case of the German branch, it was soon alleged that they pursued terrible aims and practiced frightful orgies. An extract from a French book of the 1790s, La Secte des Illuminés, will give a fair idea of this. The huge chateau of Ermininville near Paris was one of the chief lodges of the illuminated. It belonged to the Marquis of Girardin, who protected Rousseau and later gave him a tomb on his estate. Saint Germain, the notable impostor, presided over it. He claimed to be a thousand years old and to be able to make gold. He was said to be immortal, but strangely died in 1784. And even today, some Looney Tune wackos claim that they converse with Saint Germain, who's still alive, walking around in a modern day suit and tie. Well, on the day of his initiation, at the Chateau of Ermininville. The candidate was conducted through a long, dark passage into an immense hall draped with black. There were faint lamps set around the room. There were men dressed as corpses in shrouds. There was an altar of human skeletons which stood in the center of a large hall and in the darkness, in the flickering low lamplight, the priests conducting the initiation resembled ghostly forms moving through the hall, and everywhere there was the stench of some terrible odor. Two men dressed as specters always appeared and tied a pink band or ribbon which was smeared with blood around the forehead of the candidate. Upon this was an image of the Lady of Loretto. Does this sound familiar, ladies and gentlemen? A crucifix was placed in his hand and an amulet hung around his neck. He was asked to remove his clothes, and if he showed any hesitancy, his clothes were removed for him and laid upon a funeral pyre. Crosses of blood were smeared upon his body, and then his genitalia were tied with a ribbon or with string. Then frightening figures, covered with blood, and mumbling strange incantations approached and threw themselves down in prayer. After a long period of time, weeping, crying, wailing broke out as if a herd, a plethora of mourners, were bereaved upon the death of their closest and deepest love. The funeral pyre burned brighter and brighter. All of the clothes of the initiate were consumed. And from behind or near this fire 
one of the priests emerged almost as if he had taken form from the smoke of the pyre itself. And the five figures went into convulsions and loud wailing and screaming took place. And then came the voice of someone concealed behind a curtain. These oaths which the candidate had to repeat. Quote, In the name of the Crucified One, I swear to sever all bonds which unite me with mother, brothers, sisters, wife, relatives, friends, mistress, king, superiors, benefactors, or any other man to whom I have promised faith, service, or obedience. Quote, I name the place in which I was born. Henceforth I live in another dimension, which I will not reach until I have renounced the evil globe which has been cursed by heaven. From now onwards I shall reveal to my new chief all that I have heard or found out, and I shall also seek out and observe things which might otherwise have escaped me. I honor the aqua tofana. It is a quick and essential medium of removing from the earth, through death or robbing them of their wits, of those who oppose truth and those who try to take it from our hands. I shall avoid Spain, Naples, and all other accursed lands, and I shall avoid the temptation to betray what I have now heard. Lightning will not strike as rapidly as the dagger which will reach me wherever I may be should I betray my initiation." Unquote. Then a seven-branched candelabrum bearing seven black candles was placed before the candidate and a large bowl containing human blood. The candidate washed himself in the blood and drank a quantity of it. The string around his genitalia was removed and then he was carried to a bath to undergo complete ablution. After this he was given a meal composed of root vegetables. Now folks <laughs> While it is possible that such ceremonies as this have actually taken place, and we know that they have, because it is exact, the exact ceremony that George Bush underwent in the crypt, or what is known as the tomb, the skull and bones, at Yale University. But it will be recalled that such items as human blood are generally not of the genuine variety in any society other than those reputed to be dedicated to criminal or perverted ends. Well, I have this to say. No one knows but those who actually take part in the ceremony, whether it's chicken blood or human blood or pig blood or cow's blood. And as with the initiations of other societies, there is no doubt that the candidate may have been made to believe that he was actually going through an initiation which involved horrible things of this nature, such as human blood. Initiation into the ancient mysteries was often accompanied by the exposure of the candidate to fear and other emotions in order to make him receptive to the oath or message which was to be made manifest. It has been said, folks, that the European version of the Order of the Illuminati contributed in no small measure to the development of revolutionary doctrines which eventually culminated in the Russian and other communist machines. And in fact, for those of serious study who have perused the depths of the available material, as I and others have, have no doubt, have no doubt whatsoever that communism, international socialism, is the direct product of the mystery schools of the Illuminati, as was the formation of this nation, which was guaranteed to lead us in to what is known as the New World Order, Novus Ordo Seclor, the formation of a one-world totalitarian state ruled by benevolent despotism, is the way that they put it, 
and there is little doubt that the order was dedicated to the overcoming of princely power, as it was then known, and to the diffusion of anti-religious ideas. And this can best be seen by examining the development of the teaching of the member as he progressed from one degree of initiation into the next. Now, folks, many young enthusiasts with a taste for mystery and a desire to fight oppression in any form were drawn through a deliberate plan from the ranks of all of the colleges and universities and from all of the other supposedly benevolent fraternal organizations. After an oath of obedience and silence had been extracted from the candidate, he was then handed over to a director or teacher, or, if you will, hierophant, to be taught that the order was one of discipline and effort, and that the final objectives were to do good through leaving aside all preconceived notions, and upon the basis of free thought, to lead mankind to salvation. But salvation granted by who? And salvation from what? That is the question that intelligent men should be asking. However, it's been my experience that most men and most women don't ask any questions whatsoever, or very few, anyway. Those who managed to show that they were likely to accept the next stage in teaching were advanced to the rank in which he was made to swear that he would work under the orders of his masters without doubt or question. He would not use his critical faculties in any way, in any matter, connected with such instructions. Now in the lower ranks are <laughs> the nursery for all you Blue Lodge Master Masons out there who think you know so much and are nothing more than the greatest group of followers ever conceived and let loose upon humanity. Yes, in the nursery, the member was very much in the dark as to the way in which the order was run and how it should accomplish its design of freeing the world. As he progressed, however, he found that a part of his service to the society was to gain financial and social power and to place them at the disposal of the group. Indeed, he was expected to be a diligent mason and to try to gain control over Freemason funds. It was not until the tenth rite of promotion had been completed that the member was given, with the grade of priest, certain definite knowledge. And now today, in the order known as the Scottish Rite, this information is not given until the candidate actually reaches the thirtieth degree, according to the actual writings of the man who was the grand commander of all Freemasonry of the world and of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry in the United States, Mr. Pike, General Pike. Well, this knowledge included the fact that the Illuminati were proposing to destroy princes and prelates throughout the world and were to remove forever the feeling of local nationality from the minds of men. Another goal was to destroy all existing religions. The ways in which this was to be done involved infiltrating high positions in education, administration of government, the military, and, of course, the press. The very highest degrees showed that the rationalism and materialism of the thinkers who developed it were determined to stamp out all belief in religion, God in any faith in a deity, the initiate was told, were human inventions, and they had no meaning whatsoever. Now this was developed further, and the member who arrived at the highest position in the order, or that designated as Rex or King, learned that he was now the same as any king, on the same level, with the same rights, and the same divine right of rule, and that all men were capable of equal advancement. But all men were not equal. Hence the need for kings over man was an illusion perpetrated by those in power, and this perpetration was to be broken at all costs. 
And the highest, for the man who sat at the head of the council, the council of hidden supervisors, made up of nine members, was designated as Rex Mundi, or literally translated, King of the World. In their machinations to overthrow, topple the kings and queens of all of the countries of the world from their thrones, they established the United States of America in the English colonies in the New World and its ultimate goal, its secret destiny, was to be the catalyst to bring into the world what they called the Great Society or the New World Order. And it certainly worked, dear listeners. As you can look back through history, the granting of the common man of liberty, fraternity, equality, freedom that he had never tasted or known before in history lit the spark that then ignited the French Revolution, of course, with the leadership and the manipulation of the people of the Illuminati, the lodges of Freemasonry, the ancient order of the Rose and Cross and others at the highest level were all the same with the same goals. And this spark of revolution spread throughout the world and until we all grow up and learn how to stop this, it will continue. As the secret societies propel us, manipulate us, deceive us, lie, operating in secret, infiltrating everything decent and good that man has ever built, destroying it from within, bringing closer and closer their goal of what they believe to be a utopia on earth, a one world totalitarian socialist order. They hope to create the world where they will rule as being the ones who possess the only truly mature minds they will establish a council of advisors to a world charismatic political and religious leader who will be the outward rule. But he will really take his orders from this benevolent despotism, this council of learned elders. And everyone on the face of this earth will be under total control for every 24-hour period of their lives. There will be one world religion catering to the needs of man, not man obeying the laws of any god. The general rule will be, as has been touted many, many times by these people, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And even murder will be considered to be a learning experience provided that the perpetrator actually learns something. People who exhibit violent tendencies as a matter of normal behavior on their part will simply be eliminated. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this is beginning to come together and make sense to you. If it doesn't, as yet, we have a long, long way to go, as you have probably already begun to understand. Now, folks, we are at the current time $1,800 in the hole for airtime. If you want this program to stay on the air, we had better start receiving some donations from your end. Now, those of you who have been donating, and some of you have sent sizable contributions to WWCR to pay for airtime, we sincerely thank you. But all those of you who have been sitting out there doing nothing, contributing nothing, and absorbing the years and years of work from me and all of the members of CAGI who bring together this wealth of information so that you can receive it. It's time that you put up your fair share, so send it in now. You can send it in to the address given at the end of this program and while you're at it ask for a packet of information and you'll get it. 
or you can call Stan at 602 567 